to come to give God praise this morning and to worship Him and to draw closer to Him. You know, I was just thinking we're getting ready to get song. But sometimes we look at God like He's this God up there that's a, that's a mean Father that's just waiting to strike you dead or waiting to spank you when you've done something good. But God's just waiting to love on you. He's just waiting to hear your praise so He can pour His love on you. He believes in you. He knows that you can make it. He's put what, he's put what you need to have in your heart for you to make it all the way home. And He just wants to love on you. Would you worship Him this morning as we sing? Hallelujah. The thing that keeps me going While the winds and rains 
you serve a God like that. He believes in you. He knows what you can take. He won't put more on your back than you can bear. I'm so glad to serve a God like that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, full of love. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? 
trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Jesus gives us two parables about prayer. So I want to tell you, I want to talk to you this morning about the pillars of prayer. The pillars of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your work. Lord, you know the heaviness on my heart this morning, Lord. Lord, help me, Father, through your Holy Spirit to convey this word to your people. Lord, my heart is heavy because I want them to understand it in the fullness that you have given it to me. Lord, help me not to get in the way of this word today, Lord. But Lord, may I be a vessel used of you. That your church would see the importance of this word in this hour today. And Lord, I give you praise, I give you thanks for it, Lord. Prepare every heart right now, Lord, to receive from you. And I give you praise and honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. I want to begin by sharing three quotes with you. The first quote is an anonymous quote. Don't know who said it. But I like it. person says, No man can live wrong and pray right. And no man can pray right and live wrong. Ben Jennings was a little bit more straightforward in, in the way he said things in his book, The Arena of Prayer, when he said, Prayerlessness is an insult of God. Every prayerless day is a statement by a helpless individual, I do not need God today. Failing to pray reflects idolatry, a trust in substitutes for God. We rely on our money instead of God's provision. We rest on our own flawed thinking rather than on God's perfect wisdom. We take charge of our lives rather than trusting God. Prayerlessness short circuits the working of God. Neglecting prayer, therefore, is not a weakness. It is a sinful choice. Oswald Chambers, most of us know him from the utmost for his highest, says these words about prayer. Prayer is not a preparation for work. It is work. Prayer is not a preparation for battle. You don't hear anything else I tell you today. Hear these words. Preparation. Prayer is not a preparation for battle. It is the battle. Prayer is twofold. Definite asking and definite waiting to receive. I want to tell you four things that I believe are essential according to this word we just read and according to the word of God. Four things I believe are essential to have a proper prayer life and to pray right. First, I want to tell you that prayer should be perpetual. The definition of perpetual is never ending or changing, occurring repeatedly, so frequent as to seem endless and uninterrupted. Jesus told them in verse 1 before he said, spoke these parables, he said these words, men ought, men ought always to pray. There's no mistaking what that word always means. That word in the Greek means always. Men ought to always pray. 
When he says men, he means humankind. Got to kind of clarify that in today's time. He means you too, women. He means you too, teenagers. <coughs> Boys and girls. He means you too. That we ought to always pray. We ought to always be in an attitude of prayer. I think why my heart is so heavy today is because the heaviness of this word is simple. We know it. We get it. But this is so essential to the kingdom of God is prayer. Because if we're not connected to the one who controls everything that goes on in our lives, then we, how, we, how can we survive? If we're not connected to the one that we need the most in our lives, then how can our children survive in this world today? We keep saying we want revival. We keep saying that we want our nation to turn around. We keep saying that we wish we had. Can we just be honest? Most of us here today, maybe not all, but most of us wish we had another president. Most of us wish we had more different Congress members. Most of us wish that, that we had something different going on in America than it is today. But I ask you, how often do you pray? How often do you seek God in prayer for our nation? Now, for some of you, that may be all, may be all the time. But I, I, I dare to say that most people, the, the, the statistics show us that most pastors don't even pray. Much less the people that sit on the pews, that sit in the seats every Sunday. Do we have a consistent prayer life? Do we seek God? Are we here just for the benefits? Are we here just so we God can bless us again today? Because we took time out of our schedule to come to church on Sunday morning. Or do we really want to seek the face of God? This is heavy this morning, I know, but I'm not going to apologize for it. Because we need this word. I need this word this morning. We should always keep the line open. We should always be talking to Him and He talking to us. We should never hang up the phone. Some of y'all may have done this. I may have done this. I don't remember doing this, but I hear a lot of people say they have. But when you were dating, some of you remember being on the phone and just sitting in silence because you're too goofy to know what to say next. <laughs> but just so you heard the other person breathing, your heart was And then a blessing just to hear him breathe today. Hey, what do you want? Uh, I just want to hear you breathe, baby. <laughs> Keep that line open. Some of you have remember falling asleep. Remember how the and some of you were on the other end of the line and heard the breathing turn to snoring. <laughs> so, well, I guess I'll call it back tomorrow. <laughs> but we were willing to just sit on the phone, really just wasting time. Honestly, just wasting time. But we were willing to do that because the one we love was on the other end. If we're going to have a productive prayer life, we got to keep the line open. We got to keep the phone off. We got to keep the phone off the hook. Not off the hook. We got to keep the phone. Well, I, don't, I forgot. I, I haven't had a regular phone in so long. I don't forget the vernacular. <laughs> we need to keep the phone on. Waiting to hear his voice again. And sometimes we might not hear much, but he's still breathing into us. He's still breathing into us. We know He's there. We can feel His presence. And we know He's there because we just spoke to Him. 
And we might wait and wait and wait to hear an answer. But we're going to keep talking and praying. And we're going to keep seeking Him and waiting to hear His response again. Ian Pound says, God's acquaintance is not made hurriedly. He does not bestow His gifts on the casual or hasty comer and goer. To be much alone with God is the secret of knowing Him and of influence with Him. Some of you say, how can I pray all day? You can be in an attitude of prayer. You can never hang up the phone. It's okay to not say amen every now and then. It's okay to just say, hey God, be with me today. And then, then say something else ten minutes later to him. But you're opening the line for him to speak back to you. It's okay to keep listening for the voice of God all day long. But it's also okay to find a secret place and really seek the face of God at times because we really need God to move in a certain situation. But we need Him all day long. We need His strength. We need His grace. We definitely need His mercy. We need His help all day long. But we need to seek God and continue to open up to Him. Jesus was an example of that. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus was God in flesh. And if He needed to pray, I know John Bradshaw needs to pray. In Luke chapter 3, He prayed at His baptism. In Matthew 11, He, was, he prayed while speaking to the Jewish leaders. In, Mark, in Matthew 14, before walking on water. Matthew 15, giving thanks to the Father before feeding 4,000. Matthew 19, laying hands on and praying for the little children. He prayed in Matthew 26 at the Lord's Supper. He prayed in Mark 1 in the morning before heading to Galilee. Do you pray before you go to work in the morning? Do you pray before you leave? Some of you do every morning. Some of you, you might have to be more intentional about that. But we ought to be praying everywhere we go. Mark 7 says, while healing a deaf and mute man, he was praying. Luke 5 said, after healing people, after healing people, he prayed. And Luke 6, praying all night before choosing his 12 disciples. You get the point yet? Some of you don't. You didn't shake your head. So Luke 9 says, he prayed at the transfiguration. Luke 10 says, at the return of the 70. Luke 11 says, he prayed before teaching his disciples the Lord's Prayer. Luke 22 says, he prayed for Peter's faith when Satan asked to sift him. John 6 says he prayed giving thanks to the Father before feeding the 5,000. John 11 says he prayed before raising Lazarus from the dead. John 12 tells us that he asked the Father to glorify his name. Matthew 26, he prayed in Gethsemane before his betrayal. John 17, he prayed for himself, his disciples, and all believers just before heading to Gethsemane. Your Jesus prayed for you. He's still praying for you. He hasn't stopped. He made his intercession for you right now as we speak. Luke 23, right after being nailed to the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He wasn't just talking about the soldiers. He was talking about you and me. Matthew 27, while dying on the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Have you ever felt like that? You ever felt like God left? In those moments of trial? In those moments that you were being persecuted? In Luke 23, in his dying breath, Jesus prayed, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He died praying. But in Luke 24, after the resurrection, he prayed a blessing on the bread before he ate with others after his resurrection. In Luke 24, also he blessed the disciples before his ascension. That was a long list, and some would say, that's not good preaching to read a whole list that long. But I want you to understand fully how many times Jesus prayed throughout the Scripture, and these are the only times that they were recorded in Scripture. If Jesus needed to pray. He didn't pray just to be an example to us. He understood as a human in flesh too. He was 100% man too. He needed the help of the Father. And he needed God to help him. And he understood that I need to pray continually. And he, and he did it. I'm glad he did it because it's an example to us to show us that we need to be in prayer.
prayer. Right. We need to be seeking God. When did he pray? He prayed perpetually. He stayed in a constant attitude of prayer. Before every journey and during the journey. Before the miracle, in the midst of the miracle, and after the miracle. He prayed for help and he prayed for th prayed prayers of thanks. He prayed before making major decisions. He prayed in the glory of God and he prayed in the midst of death. Our Lord prayed. And if he needs to pray, I need to pray. And if he needs to pray, you need to pray. We need to be seeking God in every area of our life constantly. How, ask yourself this. How different would your life look even right now if you would have started doing that when you were a teenager, some of you? Some of you are teenagers. If you'd have done that from the time you were a kid, how different would your life be right now if we would do that? But let me ask you this. We can't change that. But what we can do is change how it's going to be 10 years from now. And if we would continue to pray right now, if we would continue to pray, if we would continue to perpetually pray and ask God to help us every step of the way, how much different would our life look 10 years from now? I'm not going to tell you you'd have a better house or you'd have a better car, but I can tell you he's going to bless you with all spiritual blessings and you're going to feel a lot better then than you do now and you're going to see some souls saved because you've been used by God and because he knows you're a vessel that keeps coming to him and he can keep filling you and he can keep speaking to you. How in the world are you going to know what to do if you're not praying and asking God and listening for his voice? He stayed in prayer continually. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 You want a memory verse to remember? That's a good one. Pray without ceasing. Here you are. That's easy enough. Pray without ceasing. That would be worth putting on your mirror in the morning to remind yourself, I need to pray today. I need to pray all day. Let's pray. Not only does it need to be perpetual, it needs to be persistent. Persistent means to continuing, continuing firmly or obstinately in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. Continuing to exist or endure over a prolonged period. Jesus said, and not to faint. Pray always, but if not to faint. In other words, don't lose heart. In the first parable that we read, some of y'all wonder when I'm going to get to that. In the first parable that we read, we see that the judge finally grants the widow's request. And we see in verse 5 why he did it. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. There was someone who was doing her harm. You go back and read that, you'll see that there was someone that had come against her and she wanted the judge to do something about it. She kept coming back to him over and over again. And some of us, especially us men, would call that nagging. But this is a woman who knew her rights and wanted to see her enemies pay for what they had she kept being persistent with her petitions. And finally, the judge responded. The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Because when we go to God and we start talking to God about the troubles in our life, because what we don't understand, we think it's just a bill that needs to be paid. And we think we just, somehow or another, we don't have the finances at the end of the day. And somehow or another, this broke down and that broke down. Some of that's just life. Some things are going to happen. It happens to the rains on the just and the unjust. Sometimes things just happen. But sometimes the things that are happening in your life is because there's an enemy coming against you trying to get you to give up. There's an enemy coming against you to try to get you to slow down. 
He sees you doing the work of the Lord and He wants to stop the work of the Lord in your life. So when you stop worrying about it and you start calling on the name of the Lord and calling on the true judge and saying, look, something's coming against me and I need you to avenge me. I need you to do something about it. When He hears you pray and seeking God for those things, He starts to tremble. Because you might say, Lord, I need the money. Lord, I need, I need help right now. Lord, I can't pay the bills. Lord, I, I, my, my son's acting crazy. I need you to do something about him. I need you to help him. I need you to help him to see the way. Well, my daughter, I can't get it right. I don't know what's going on with her right now. I don't know what's happening right now. There's something in my spirit, and I don't know why I'm so sad right now. And you're coming against depression. And you're, you're, you ought to. You ought to come against those spirits of depression. But what, sometimes when we pray, we're praying for material things. But what the Lord knows, and what the Spirit knows, and what, when, when He begins to pray for you, He understands that this is a spiritual fight that you're fighting. Because we can't see the spiritual world. And sometimes we get caught up in the physical world. But then when we begin to pray, and we begin to seek God, that's where the battle comes. Because, it, because God knows to fix the problem, I've got to get rid of the enemy that's causing the problem. That's why the devil trembles. That's why the devil shakes. Because when we begin to pray, we enter into spiritual warfare. You might not feel like a warrior. You might not feel like you don't have to yell. You don't have to shout. I know I do enough of it for everybody. But you don't have to yell. You don't have to shout. I just get excited about the word of God. You don't have you can say it just as soft as you want to say it. And you can proclaim it just as soft as your personality gives you. But I can tell you that when you pray, all of heaven hears it. And when you pray, all of heaven will respond. And when you pray, the demons will tremble and they will begin to run. And regardless of what your need is, God's going to answer it because he's a good, good father. And he's going to do everything he can to bless his children that take time to pray to him. Right. If you'll be persistent. Yes. But sometimes God wants to see how bad we really want it. Sometimes God wants to see where our faith really is. Sometimes He wants to see if we're just throwing something out there hoping that He's able or if we're going to come back and say, I, I, my theology has changed a lot about this over the years because I used to believe all you had to do was pray at once. And that's enough. God hears it. But sometimes God wants to know. Jesus went to give this parable if this was the case. Sometimes God wants to see where your faith is. Are you just throwing it out there hoping there's a God somewhere that's listening? Are you coming back and saying, look, judge, I know you've got the authority. I know you have the power. And I'm coming to you because I know there's an enemy coming against me right now. And I need you to step in and take care of the enemy for me. And when we don't hear the answer, we don't get mad at it. We don't get upset with it. He's okay with that if you get a little upset about it. But we don't have to get mad. We don't have to get upset. What do we do? We enter right back into the courtroom. And we look at the judge. And we say, Judge, I know this guy has done me wrong. This enemy's coming after me. I need you to do something about it. And if we come to the courtroom long enough, Jesus was talking about God in the story. Jesus said, if you come enough, now he's not the wicked judge. He's a just judge. But if you come to him enough, he's going to say, my goodness, this woman, this man, this teenager, this kid keeps coming to me about this same thing. It's on their heart. They want it. So why don't you? He'll send some angels to come and take care of the enemy for him. He doesn't even have to do it. He'll just send an angel to come and take care of the enemy for him. And, and, and take care of the enemy for you. And then your answer to your prayer will come. But we've got to be persistent. But all too often we pray for a little bit and then we stop. And then we just assume it must not be the Lord's will. Maybe the Lord's will is for you to just keep believing. Believing enough. Yeah, I like that push. Pray until something happens. Keep praying until something happens. Keep being persistent in your prayers. That's what this woman did. She kept coming before him. Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Let your request be known 
unto God. Be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious about anything. Because the God we serve has authority to take care of all of it. We must be persistent in our prayers. Persistent, show your faith. The things we stop praying for are the areas of our lives that we have lost faith in. Do you still pray that God will help you in your weakness? Do you still pray that God will save that lost loved one? Or turn the situation that you're in around? Do you still pray for that? Or have you given up hope? As I was talking about earlier, do you still pray for your country? Do you still pray that God will fix our government? Do you pray... You single people, do you still pray that you'll find a spouse or you just gotten rid of it? Keep praying, brother. <laughs> if it's the Lord's will, eventually he'll send you. You married people, do you still pray that God will fix your marriage and strengthen your marriage? Yeah. Or have you given up on it? Where's your faith today? Do you still pray that God will fix you? Or have you given up on the fact that you could ever be any use to the kingdom of God? Don't give up on it. He hasn't given up on you. The things that we continue to pray for show our faith is still there. Dave says, don't give in to doubt, fear, unbelief, discouragement, or use excuses for unbelief when prayer is not answered immediately. Rebuke and resist all opposition to the answer and all suggestions of faith. It is a divine, blood-bought right to get an answer. So do not lose heart. Be persistent in your prayers. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep holding on to the promises of God for your life. There are things you're not going to be able to see how it's going to work out. But it's going to work out. I love what Tony Evans says. If you, all you see is what you see, you will never see all there is to be seen. I'm going to read that again for some of y'all. Y'all look at me quizzically. If all you see is what you see, you will never see all there is to be seen. There are things out there that we walk by faith knowing that God's going to do. We've got to walk by faith and keep praying and keep being persistent and perpetual in our prayers. But prayer should also be personal. In the second parable, the Pharisee compared himself to everyone else. What he was saying there in the first part of that parable when it showed him praying is he was saying, I'm better than them. I think I'm better than everyone else, so I must be good. My life has prospered. My life has brought me to this point today. I don't sin like those other people. I don't do those visible sins like those other people. So I must be better than them. So all his prayers sound like is thank God that I'm not like them. He boasts of all he does for the Lord, the tithing, the fasting. And those things are definitely not wrong. But it's all about him. Self-righteousness and pride. Nothing, nothing like, nothing will kill a prayer like one of these two things. Prayer without humility is wasted words. Jonathan Cash, where I'm from, he used to be a weatherman, turned preacher. He said these words in one of his books, God longs for deep, honest conversation with his loved ones, but too often he gets only passing glances of self-righteous nods. I'm hitting you with a lot of quotes today. Charles Spurgeon said, I have no confidence at all in polished speech or brilliant literacy or literary effort to bring about a revival, but I have all the confidence in the world in the poor saint who would keep, who would weep her eyes out because people are living in sin. This publican was one of those people. In verse 13, he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. True prayer, the prayer that touches the heart of God, will always be personal. When you look beyond yourself and see everybody else is worse than you, 
when you don't allow God to look in, now it might be the case that you're living right, there's nothing that you need to fix, and there's nothing the Spirit of God needs to fix, but I want to shake your hand if that's the case. Because we all need some of that. We're all, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. We're all a work in progress. God is always working on us and revealing things in us that we need to work on ourselves, but that the Spirit of God is going to help us with. But when we pray, we ought to always ask God to reveal in me what it is you want to do in me today, Lord. How do I need to change? What do I need to do today to fall into your will? Prayer is more than just petitioning God for physical things. Prayer is about seeking God for what is going to last. Well be on your lifespan. We must allow prayer to be personal. You must come with humility and honesty. Knowing that we are nothing without. And then the fourth thing. Prayer should be passionate. Passionate. Showing or caused by strong feelings or strong belief. When we really believe that we serve a God who's able, then we'll be passionate about what we pray. My hope for you today is that you'll never say a prayer. Yes, say it in humility, but never say a prayer where there's any hint of doubt in your voice when you pray. But pray a prayer with passion, knowing that God is going to work it out. Praying a prayer already thankful for the outcome because you know your God's going to come through. John Bunyan said, when thou prayest, rather let thy heart be without words than thy words without heart. Verse 13. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes in heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. First of all, I want to show you, I'm going to do this quickly. Stood afar off. I said I will never go say that ever again. But I'm going to do it quickly. But I will. Stood afar off. His counterpart walked to the front of the temple, but this man stood afar off. He did not feel even worthy to be in God's house. The Bible says he wouldn't even look up to pray. He was ashamed of what he had done. It says he also smote upon his breast. That was a sign of mental grief. If you look at Luke 23, 48, sometime, if some of y'all want to write that down, Jeremiah 31, 9, those are scriptures that will show you examples of when people are in mourning or they're in grief, they are beat their chest. And I can just see this guy praying this prayer as he's looking down to the ground and seeing in his eyes probably the Pharisee was better than him. In his eyes... But he comes in with humbleness, not wanting to be where the rest of the crowd is, but just wanted to be close to the presence of God. He's looking down at his feet, and he begins to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he cries out in passion before God. He makes his prayer personal before God. And he says, look, I don't know about everybody else, but I know I need you today. Oh, yeah. I don't know what everybody else is doing. I'm not trying to be better than everybody else. I'm trying to be a God that comes before you today and says, I need you. I know I need you today. He was passionate before God because he knew he deserved death. He deserved wrath. I'm not asking her to come to the piano. You'll find out why I'm here. He deserved wrath. But he cried out for 
of mercy. He said, God, what he was saying is, God, I deserve to die for what I've done, but I just need your mercy. Would you show me your mercy? I deserve to be punished. I deserve death. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. I deserve death. The God of crying out for your mercy. I don't have time to look at everybody else today because I need change in me. He understood the holiness of God. And he understood who he was compared to the holiness of God. He's saying, I know I don't deserve it. Because if I did, it wouldn't be mercy. Give me mercy, God. I'm telling you this morning, you might not need to say that prayer for yourself this morning, but you might. But you might need to say it for your children. You might need to say it for your family. You might need to say it for your nation. I know you do. But God's looking for some people who are willing to pray consistently. Who's willing to, 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 to give a perpetual prayer. A persevering prayer. That's willing to be personal if they have to be. But he wants some people that are passionate about him. If we want to see revival, you will never find a reason. You just have to trust me with this. But if you're trying to find it, you're wasting your time. But if you go back and look at history and look at every major revival that happened, it started with prayer. Amen. It started with prayer meetings. It started with people who didn't know what else to do but just get together and pray. Most of the time it was uneducated people that didn't have a clue about what was going on in their lives, didn't know what was going on, didn't have a clue about it, about how to get a job, didn't know, they, they worked hard, but most of the time those people that saw revival were people who did not know how a clue about even playing instruments or how to sing to where it sound beautifully or even how to preach. But all they knew is they were read about a man named Jesus and they read about the Spirit of God that could fill a church and they decided to get together and begin to pray passionately to God and God filled the place. We need that kind of revival. You need that kind of revival in your life. Not just church services. We thank God for those revivals we can have. But not just church services, but you need something to get a revival that gets inside of you and changes everything about you and changes everybody around you. I've got to be obedient to the Lord. This morning I was snatching the wall to call this morning. This morning as I was getting ready, you might not understand this, but those who have preached before and those who have sought God for anything like that, you know, you, you'll understand what I'm about to say. Sermon's ready. I'm ready to go. Just go in the closet to get my clothes. And I felt the Spirit of God speaking to me and said, pray for the children. If you're going to preach about prayer, start with kids.
that thought came to me, and immediately I lost my breath. I don't know if that makes sense to y'all. That might be some spooky stuff to y'all. I don't know. But I lost my breath. I literally had to hang over. I didn't even tell my wife that told anybody. But I literally had to put my hands on my knees and get my breath back. Because the moment God spoke it, the enemy was trying to steal it. My mind was going to steal it. First thing he told me to do is tell every kid that's a senior and below that would be willing to do that. 